abnormality in places of confinement, inmates' fantasies or reality? It is generally believed that in places of detention ghosts are extremely rare. They say that it is bad even for spirits, but many examples prove the opposite. For example, a group of British experts in the field of paranormal phenomena, examining the old prison in the city of Melbourne, came to the conclusion that in the castle, where at one time 136 people were hanged, there are anomalies. According to parapsychologist Darren Dawn, the equipment recorded a number of unexplainable phenomena. For example, unusual electromagnetic activity was detected, and many members of the group heard strange voices. An inmate in Weinsberg prison in Germany, Elizabeth S. Linger, 39, once complained that she was visited every night by the spirit of a Catholic priest named Senten. The deceased told her that he had committed many sins during his lifetime and asked her to pray for him. The famous German scientist Julius Kerner, then a prison doctor, became interested in this case. Together with seven respected people in the city, he monitored the bad cell for 11 weeks. They managed to witness unusual auditory and visual phenomena, footsteps and visions of a vague human figure surrounded by a phosphorescent glow. Sometimes the voice of a ghost was heard, whose appearance was accompanied by a strong corpse odor. After he touched the prisoner several times, burns occurred at the points of contact. Remarkably, all this time the prison building was shaken by strange underground tremors. Unfortunately, the priest did not want to contact anyone except Elizabeth, and she herself died of a stroke two weeks later. A year ago, the agency Reuters reported on the experiment conducted by a group of psychologists from the University of Hertfordshire, who tried to scientifically test the evidence of ghosts in the old prisons and dungeons of Edinburgh. Over the course of 10 days, 240 volunteers from around the world tracked ghosts in the famous Edinburgh Castle, which served as a prison several centuries ago. The experiment was a near success, one felt as if something red-hot had been placed on his arm, another panicked when he heard ominous breathing in the corner of an ancient cell. Some felt ghosts touching their faces and tugging at the edges of their clothes. And others saw a sullen personality in a bloody leather apron in the torture cellar. The former Melbourne prison building has now been turned into a museum, but custodians claim it contains more than just antiquities. The last time a ghost caught the eye of the night watch. February 5th. Six late-night visitors swear they saw something cross the gallery with a candle in its hand. The candle burned brightly, but for some reason did not illuminate the surrounding objects at all. It is known that on June 21, 2003, a woman's voice was calling for help all night in a part of the castle where no one was or could be. After studying the prison archives, the museum administration learned that it was on that day in 1865, prisoner Lucy R. committed suicide. Her cell was in the same block where the screams were heard. Paranormal researchers decided to visit the cell on the next anniversary of her death, which they did this year, but contrary to expectations, nothing happened. However, when they listened to the tape recorded at night, a woman's voice was clearly heard on the tape. This time it did not call out for help. The woman simply said, go away. The famous Tower Castle in London, once a place of detention for particularly dangerous aristocratic criminals, has long been famous for its ghosts. The ghost of Anne Boleyn, one of the wives of King Henry VIII, has long troubled the tower's inhabitants. Unjustly accused, she ended up in prison, where in 1536 she was beheaded. The coffin with her decapitated body was buried under a slab in St. Peter's Chapel. Since then, Anne's ghost has often appeared in various places in the castle, in the main tower, in the cell where she was imprisoned, near the scaffold. The most authentic appearance of Anne's ghost dates back to 1864. It was then that the captain of the guard, on his rounds, found one sentry at his post unconscious. When he regained consciousness, he told him that he saw a woman in white walking out the door of the room where Anne had spent the night before her execution. The figure floated straight towards the sentry. He ordered her to stop, but she did not respond. Then the sentry plunged his bayonet into the woman, but it went through without encountering any obstacle. It was only then that the brave man realized what he was dealing with and immediately lost his senses. The captain did not really believe his subordinate's story, believing that he had simply fallen asleep at his post, and the sentry faced a court-martial. The documents of this unusual trial are still intact to this day. Testimony was heard from the guards, who corroborated the defendant's testimony, they, do, had more than once encountered a ghost who disappeared after the eyewitness had fainted. In the end, the sentry was acquitted. Sometimes Anna was seen strolling around without her head. One day a guard officer noticed that the windows of the locked St. Peter's Chapel were lit. When he attached a ladder to its wall and climbed to the top, he saw a ghostly procession inside the building headed for the altar. 
At its head was a woman whom he recognized at once as Lady Boleyn, whom he had known from many portraits. On reaching the altar, the ghosts vanished into thin air. When the floor of the chapel was opened, the skeletons of more than 200 people were found under the stone slabs. Perhaps the handsome Italian Carlo Dalzetti, with blue eyes full of grief over his wife's death, would have escaped justice had he not been accused of murder by a spirit. On the anniversary of her daughter's death, her mother Anna Caldo suddenly awoke in the middle of the night, a transparent female figure stood at her bedside. I am your daughter. Mrs. Caldo heard. I have been waiting all year for justice. Know that Carlo, my husband, killed me. He did it when I caught him in bed with Blanca Amato. She witnessed the crime. He grabbed me by the throat so I couldn't scream, and he stabbed me through the heart with an awl. Then he put me in a bag and took me to a vacant lot, where they found me a day later. The spirit had disappeared. The shocked woman rushed to the police. Inspector Paolo Veroni did not want to believe me at first. Mrs. Caldro told Italian newspaper reporters. Finally, at my desperate pleas, he agreed to inspect the old well. There they found everything my Maria's spirit had spoken of. The police detained Carlo Dalzetti, along with Blanca Amato, and set up an investigative experiment at the old well. When he saw the bag, dress, and all being pulled out, he broke down, and Blanca confessed that she had witnessed the murder. The court sentenced Dalzetti to life in prison, but he served only one year, in a suburb of Naples. On the second anniversary of the crime, he suddenly went mad, he began to rush around the cell, screaming, hiding under his bunk. The doctor gave him a sedative injection. At night the guard heard a terrible scream from Dalzetti's cell. When he opened the door, he saw the prisoner lying face up on the floor. His eyes were full of terror, his face contorted with mortal fear. He was dead. The doctors confirmed death as the result of a ruptured heart. They could not explain, however, where the inscription on the cell wall had come from. You got it. It wasn't Dalzetti's blood type. Russia has plenty of ancient prisons that are steeped in legend, but unlike in Europe, most of these prisons are still in operation today. So scientifically proving the presence of ghosts in them is problematic. At the same time, there are plenty of reports from inmates about encounters with otherworldly entities. Now, let's get into some prison stories from Russia. Some creepy, others not so much, some happen to me, some are prison legends, so to speak. In the span of a couple of days, I'll try to post everything. Let's start with the first prison where I was incarcerated at in the 2000s, the 5th Central Prison in Moscow, SIZO 77-5. Apparently due to the fact that one unit there is a juvenile detention center, there are all sorts of stories about the paranormal there. The prison is old, they say all prisons in Moscow were built by Catherine II in the form of the letters of her name, if you look from the air. Whether it is true or not, there is no way to check. There are two buildings at the 5th Central Prison, the old and the new one. The new one had juveniles, at that time, how it is now, I do not know, the old one had adults. They are connected to each other by a gutter, this is what they called the long iron corridor connecting the buildings, because it hangs in the air, is poorly lit and very cold. There are several legends about the prison, the first connected with that very Catherine. They say that at night, in the gutter, you can hear the neighing of horses, the clatter of hooves and at times even Catherine herself in a chariot. Another legend, about a little 14 year old boy beaten to death in a punishment cell by utter human trash, and of his cries being heard from the vents at night. The first story which happened to me personally at the prison is related to this very legend. I should mention that it was at a press hada, where the cops left me for three months to hang dry. For those of you unaware, a press hada is a larger type of cell, usually filled with huge and intimidating inmates. These tend to cooperate with the prison officers, willing to do almost whatever to shorten their sentence. Usually that comes in the form of beating, or worse, a confession out of other inmates for the officer's benefit. A couple of weeks after this incident, the cell was split up and I was transferred to a general population cell. In this cell there were only Cherkas, non-Russians, who, at the instigation of the Kuma, prison detective, tried to beat out a confession from me. So there was no way to mention or talk about the event to them. It is quite possible that this is why we encountered this garbage there. Negative energy and all that. At the time of the story, the cell was almost completely redistributed and was much more humane. The incident occurred around midnight, closer to 1 am. By then, everyone apart from me, and a roadman were asleep. A roadman, in prison, is essentially a person who builds these so-called roads, allowing inmates to communicate with each other, catch up and talk, 
send items, etc. These roads, usually in the form of connected vents, or ropes outside the window, are chosen to be outside the view of the cameras. Communication with the neighboring cell happened through a vent, the neighbor rang, knocked a certain pattern into the wall, and pulled themselves up to the vent to talk. There were no cameras in front of our cell, and the cell to our left was for the lower class in the prison hierarchy, but it was empty at the time, there were only people in the cell to our right. So, it was quiet, and suddenly I hear a crying coming out of the vent. A childlike crying, but very faint. I ask the roadie, and he says he hears it too. I ring the neighboring cell, they pull up to the vent and I ask, is it someone in your cell that is crying? But they reply no. Well, generally, even in juvenile detention, you'll rarely see anyone cry in front of others, for obvious reasons. I inquired if they hear the crying as well, but they replied they did not. I get off the vent and the crying is still continuing. I was not shitting bricks at this time, just intrigued. Immediately we remembered the story about the kid, and then the crying stopped. Though, outside the windows, there is the sound of swinging and children's laughter. Outside the windows overlooking the prison yard, where, of course, there can be no swings and no children at all. At this point, some bricks were already laid by us. Not long after everything went quiet, just as it was before the crying originally started. A story told to me happened in one of the Smolensk pretrial detention centers. A serial murderer nicknamed Ryaka fell into the hands of law enforcement agencies, but investigators could not get a confession out of him. Then one day the repeat offender came in for questioning with a shaking head and a deadened look. I want to go to jail, he declared from the threshold, demanded a pen and paper, and immediately scribbled a confession. What had happened? It turned out that at night, an unknown guard summoned Ryaka into the corridor, his cellmates, by the way, confirmed this fact, he led him down a dark corridor, then pushed him into an office. In the office, three men dressed in black were sat at the table. Without further ado they read out their verdict to Ryaka, at the end of which they said, Sentence, execution. The sentence must be carried out at once. The same mysterious people took the poor man out into the prison yard, where several of the convicts were already shivering with cold. One by one the convicts were led to the pit by the wall, and shots were fired. It was Ryaka's turn. He was seized with terror. And then the first ray of sunlight fell on the roof of the detention center. That one, tomorrow. Ryaka heard, after which the firing squad vanished into thin air, and he found himself back in his cell. In the end, the murderer's nerves gave out. In the Perm region the story of the indestructible snitches passed on by word of mouth. There was a certain Yerima, who was behind the barbed wire during the 90s. He had a talent for finding out all about the convicts and informing the authorities. One day, the guys on the outside had drugs transported into the prison. Yerima snitched right away, and the criminals were put into a punishment cell, which in these sorts of prisons meant solitary confinement, as well as being the punching bag of any guard who was in a bad mood that day. A few days later the snitch was found with a shiv in between his ribs. Since then his ghost has been haunting the barracks. Moreover, Yerima appears precisely at those times when prisoners are talking about business. A strange story once happened to a recidivist who was serving his sentence in a Mordovia minimum security camp. It happened like this, three criminals started an escape. They made a hidden hole in the barbed wire fence and started digging a tunnel through the floor of the camp's kitchen. When everything was ready, they assembled at the appointed place. One immediately climbed out through the tunnel, and the second followed him. The third turned around, and froze in place, over the table hung a shimmering cloud, from which a transparent woman's face was seen. The cloud approached him, and a woman's voice said, Go back to the barracks, or you'll be killed, they're rounding you up. Then the vision disappeared. Looking in the direction of the tunnel the poor fugitive found that his companions had already fled. However, remembering the words of the ghostly woman, he decided to return to the barracks. At that time shots were heard outside. As it became known the next day, both of his accomplices had been killed. It turned out that one of them had blabbed about the escape to his friend, who turned out to be a snitch, and the information about their plan had reached the superiors. The third was lucky, they could not prove his involvement in the escape. Apparently, the silence of prison corridors is sometimes broken not only by the ringing of shackles and creaking doors. There's almost no mysticism here, but it's quite an entertaining story. We decided to summon the Queen of Spades when we were still in juvie. There were nine of us in the cell, seven of whom were in jail for murder. Some had one body, others had four. Among the relevant people who deserved attention were Goose and the Permian Maniac. Goose was a pretty odd but interesting man, 
except for the fact that he and his friends killed five people, maybe more, maybe less, I don't remember. According to his words, he could not walk until the age of five, he had problems with his spine and was carried around in a wheelchair. After that, someone from his family took him to a witch or a healer, and she put him on his feet. He could walk, but he was moving with his head wobbling back and forth, that's why his nickname in prison was Goose. As Goose grew up, he began to kill. He was in jail because he and a couple of his friends killed a bunch of drunks who had occupied a gazebo in a small wooded area where they were hanging out. Among these drunks was a champion of skating in the USSR, don't try to google it, Anon, I tried, I couldn't find it. But in the case file that Goose let me read, I saw it with my own eyes. They warned the drunks a couple of times to vacate the gazebo, but they didn't listen. A couple of days later, Goose and a couple of his friends came in, armed with knives and a stick with a nail. After stabbing one drunkard, who had stepped away from the gazebo to take a walk or a piss, they went to the clearing in front of the gazebo. Here's the best part, one of the drunks which was female, they did not kill women, saw them, with knives in their hands and bloody, and in a frightened voice muttered. Guys, who are you? I read it all in the case file myself. To which Goose's accomplice replied, We're not guys. We're Satan. And went on to cut up her friends. To one of the victims he left 132, as I remember now, holes in his head, punctured with a stick and a nail. The perm maniac, who we nicknamed the cunt, as it turned out later, he was also a rapist, but luckily they had already taken him away from the central prison, killed four people in one night with a friend. Two 14-year-old kids in Perm inhaled glue and bet on how many people they could kill in one night. They managed to kill a couple of guys, with some disturbing details. For example, they killed one at a bus stop, and he was sitting on his corpse, breathing glue, while people walked by and nobody really gave a shit. And the other one had his leg cut off and wanted to boil it and eat it, but they changed their mind. So it was Goose who suggested trying to summon the Queen of Spades. Inside the juvenile unit, unlike an adult, the lights are turned off at night and only the nightlight is left on. We draped two windows in the cell with blankets and hung a nightlight. It became almost completely dark in the cell. As my eyes got used to it, I, Goose and Perm's maniac went to the bathroom, a partition fenced off by an semi-wall with a sink and the mirror we needed, to call upon the Queen of Spades. The rest stayed on the bunks to watch. Goose drew, with soap or toothpaste, I do not remember, a ladder and a dot, and started muttering an invocation. We waited to see what would happen. The maniac from Perm started to panic, grabbed my leg, I was much taller than he was, and he started shaking, shouting. It's moving, it's moving. I look in the mirror, the point seems to be in place. And Goose started teasing, laughing ominously and saying, Next morning. From which the Permian maniac began to panic even more and yelled for the Goose to shut up and wipe the ladder off the mirror. I decided to step back and watch from the sidelines, so I went and laid down on the bunk. The maniac from Perm tried to break the mirror, but Goose would not let him, Goose was also about 2 meters tall. The maniac starts yelling that he's going to kill him, Goose is smiling and says go ahead. The Permian maniac floundered and ran to the tongue, near the windows, a shelf in the wall, fastened with large bolts. The point is, one of the bolts we loosen and remove from the wall, and the bolt is of such dimensions that it realistically could crack someone's skull. We hollowed out a place in the wall to store it in, which doubled as a way to communicate with the neighboring cell. So this motherfucker from Perm runs up and grabs the bolt. We're yelling at him to put it down. But he went for Goose. Goose stood his ground, ready and waiting. The maniac runs up to the far side, looks at Goose, looks at the mirror, suddenly his face is distorted in horror and he begins to hammer the mirror with the bolt. And the mirrors in the prison are such that it is impossible to break them. Or rather, it is covered with cracks and no more. Well, he cracked the whole mirror, and only after that he calmed down. He went to remove the bolt and went to bed exhausted. We decided it wasn't worth alerting any guards in the unit. This next story is also about the 5th Central, which I did not witness myself, but repeatedly heard about it in juvenile detention. I doubt it's real, but it delivers. In the early 2000s, as usual at night, in the juvenile unit, in one of the cells, a road man suddenly heard a noise on the floor below, as if someone was scraping on the bars. Suddenly the horse, a type of road where a rope is lowered from one of the cells on the floor above for the cell below, respectively, was abruptly ripped from his hands, leaving burn marks on his hands. They heard a wild roar in the cell and saw something big and covered with thick, red hair run up and down the bars on the floor above. Then the boys became a little bolder, and looking out the window, they saw a large, 
about 2 meters high, humanoid haired beast with long claws running up the gutter with a road in its paws. After running through the gutter, it jumped onto the administration building and disappeared behind the wall. Some who remember, there were such books with horror stories, Yuspinsky's I think, some kind of folklore. And there was a story about a shaggy monster, which opened the tents of tourists with a long fingernail. The description reminded me of him. Among themselves, the inmates nicknamed it the Shaggy Cop, because it ripped off the roads. This story is not necessarily creepy and mystical story, but it's noteworthy. So, there was this trash of a person, the kids nicknamed him Kodops, Cat Dog. The idea was that at night, on his watch, you could hear a quiet meowing or yapping from the Pradal, prison corridor. You go to the cell door, you listen, you hear rustling and barking. You can quietly meow yourself and in response you hear either a plaintive meow or a bark. So it was the corpulent bastard that was having so much fun. The fact is that he was not doing it to amuse the juvenile convicts. He meowed on duty on both the adult corps and the juvenile corps. And always only at night. The cuckoo cop was clearly crazy, but no one fired him, they kept him. Maybe he works there now, even though he was already of age. His crazy nature was solidified when at an inspection in my cell, he grabbed one of the boys by the dick, for which he got hit in his right ear. The boy was not even sent to the isolation ward for this. Well, according to prison law, this Kodops had once participated in a violent suppression of a riot as part of the mask squad. It was said that on that day the prison special forces were especially brutal, and one of the most brutal ones had his mask ripped off and his face set alight. That was Kodops. After that, the criminals went free, and they butchered Kodops's family, wife and daughter. I don't know if it's true or not, but they say that it was after that, that he went cuckoo. This one occurred at the Mosheski Central, where I was waiting in a cell for further placement as an adult. We were in a transit cell on the first floor of the prison. The first floor was in a semi-basement room. You could look through the window and see the legs of cops passing by, at Voronezh Central, the same thing happened at one of the buildings. The cell was constantly damp, you came back from the sauna, hung a towel and it didn't get dry all the way. At that time there were three of us sitting there. Me, Snake. A 19-year-old kid who was doing his second time for stabbing a cab driver in the neck because he called him a jerk, and Dolphin, whom I had known since Central 5, a minor, though he was an adult now, too. The cell had four bunks. Snake was into all sorts of mysticism and esotericism, and he offered us the idea of playing a prank on someone who would come to our cell that we were sectarians. At the time I felt myself going a bit crazy, I had been in the four walls for almost two years now, I still could not be out in the yard and I went around the unit pushing all sorts of mysticism related topics. From the apocalypse, to the four horsemen, the battle of light versus darkness, etc., which prompted him to do the prank. I agreed, Dolphin was indifferent. Snake painted a lot of different symbols on the four corners of the cell, and I was not very good at them, but besides the pentagram, there were Egyptian symbols and some other things I was unfamiliar with. A kid named Stas, who'd been in prison since he was in his teens for killing trash, came into our cell. He at first fell for our prank, but soon figured us out, as we quickly got tired of it. Although Snake did not erase the symbols. So, one night, if the atmosphere in the cell was dark, then all the action usually happened at night, we started talking about various stories, and I told one I heard back in my neighborhood when I was in the village, about how some guys were summoning the devil. They gathered at one of the people's involved house, which was an old trailer, drew a pentagram on a mirror, and one stood in front of it with a cross in his hands. At 12 o'clock at night, the king of hell supposedly came out of there and started ripping the cross out of the kid's hands. The others did not have time to erase the pentagram from the mirror and when the cross was ripped out of his hands, the kid died. After these stories, Snake decided to carry out this experiment in our cell. I didn't have much desire, or rather I didn't have any at all to go through with this, and Dolphin was not interested in these topics whatsoever, but Stas was interested. They drew a pentagram on a mirror, and at about 12 o'clock at night, Snake stood with a cross. Nothing happened. They erased everything from the mirror. The next day we learned that in the assembly, a cell in which inmates are kept after arrival to the prison, before they get transferred to a unit, that at night, a man hanged himself by the sheets. Well, we thought it was a coincidence, alright, it happens. The guy's on the loose and hangs himself. A day or two goes by. It's about 1 or 2 in the morning. Dolphin and Stas are sleeping. Me and Snake are awake. I'm standing with my back to the entrance of the cell. In this cell, by the way, it's the only cell I've ever seen that way, where the debak, 
prison table, is located, on one side is the toilet and on the other is Ishkaner, a sort of metal prison bench. Which means that if a person needs to sit down to eat, he either sits on the bench in front of the debak, or on the toilet. Behind the debak on the lower bunk, facing the entrance, sat Snake. I was sitting on the Shkunner facing him. We were chatting about something, I don't remember what, when suddenly, Snake's eyes widen. Look, he whispers, and pokes a finger behind my back. I smirk, because Snake was a fan of this kind of teasing, and I tell him, come on, you're hilarious, but Snake's eyes are really frightened, and he continues, look, look. I look behind me at the vent, located at the far corner of the cell, from which flows blood. A few of these trickles that get a little stronger, but pouring exactly in a trickle, not profusely. I tried to think rationally at first, thinking it was dirty water. Subconsciously, though, I already knew that it was blood. At first, I went up to the wall, smeared some on my finger, and examined it, it indeed was blood. I thought that maybe a rat was running down the vent, got caught on something, and so it's bled. I say to Snake, come and give me some light. He comes up, climbs up on the semi-wall of the toilet, which is located adjacent to the vent. He shines through the vent with some matches, as I look down the vent from the far side of the cell. There's blood coming out of nowhere. Out of fucking nowhere. I mean, right in the middle of the vent that leads to our cell, not in the far reaches. That's when we got scared. We stood in the middle of the cell and waited for it to stop. When it stopped, we foolishly wiped it with a sponge and detergent. Why foolishly? Because in the morning neither Stas nor Dolphin believed us. Though, the strangest thing was that that night, while there was bleeding from the vent, another convict had hanged himself in one of the cells on the floor above. There were two people in that cell, one of them, the suicidal neighbor I had crossed paths with in Smolensk. The other later told he went to bed as if nothing had happened, the neighbor stayed on the road. He wakes up in the middle of the night, sees he's hanging out on the grate, on a sheet. After that, we washed all those symbols from the cell corners. By the way, that's why I find this story at least strange, suicide in Russian prisons is pretty rare. This was at a prison in Mogilyov, where I was sent to serve out the rest of my sentence. The end of 2012 or so. There is a place there, called the Chorniki. There are six cells for three people each on the first floor. Kind of like a prison holding facility. And so I resided in my cell with two other people, Salaya and Villa. Let me tell you right away, my relationship with them did not work out quite well. The reason for this is that Salaya was a kind of energy vampire. For normal activity it was constantly necessary to swear, to be rude, to spoil the mood of others, etc. So, of course I didn't keep quiet and answered him, and because of the constant quarrels we in the cell sometimes did not talk to each other for weeks. Although, we did not fight. The order on that cell block was such that you couldn't place a hand on anyone for no reason. If you hit somebody except for a direct insult, the cops would come and fuck you up, so there you go. Nobody wanted that, so they never crossed the line. The other one, Villa, was stupidly following his lead, sucking his dick, so to speak. In short, I'll tell you this the atmosphere in the prison complex was very unpleasant, you just felt it in your skin. The cell itself was tiny, one three-tiered bunk, an area of about nine square meters, I think, no more. Don't forget that these nine squares meters are still filled with furniture, wash basin, table, bench, toilet, locker, etc. So across the wall from us in the next cell, lived a man, nicknamed Kuldun, sorcerer. His name was Yanis, Armenian. Here is worth saying a few words about how we communicated with the neighboring cells. As you know, there are three types of roads, by air, rope, in the wet, sink or toilet, or by a kabura, hole in the wall. We had a kabura, but it was narrow, so we mostly communicated through the toilet. The toilet was close enough to the neighbors, such that we could pass objects without a horse, rope. That is, if you need a newspaper, for example, just wrap it in a bag, put your hand in the toilet, almost up to the elbow. The toilets were very wide there, and the neighbor took it, washed his hands, and voila. Well, me and this Kuldun often rubbed shoulders with all sorts of esoteric topics. He bragged to everyone that he was a great magician, walking wherever he wanted through his dreams, call the spirits to do his bidding. Where he was traveling or what he ordered the spirits to do, he never said. He bought souls from some dickheads in the prison for two packs of cigarettes. They'd put their blood in his notebook and signed to say they were selling their souls. Whatever. Anyway, they were summoning spirits in a nearby cell, using a magic circle that the sorcerer drew on a piece of cotton paper, with his blood in it and some incantations. 
It was a circle on the paper which resembled something like a dream catcher, divided into sectors, with a letter in each sector. A needle on a thread was placed in the center and held by the summoner slightly above the paper, allowing it to spin. During a conversation with the spirit, the needle points to the letters which formed words that the spirit was trying to say. So, Salai asked Koldun to bring this piece of paper into our cell to communicate with the spirits. He handed it over. They made a fuss right away regarding it and wanted to call the spirits. Why the fuck not? Besides they do nothing all day long, just smoke one after the other and drink she fear, telling each other how many women they've fucked in the wild. And suddenly here's something they can play with. They immediately tried to persuade me to do it, knowing that I was also interested in it, I was meditating and doing yoga in my cell, reading the relevant literature. I said leave me alone, I will not do this crap, saying they can harm themselves if they don't know anything regarding the topic. As a result, they were on their own. In short, they put the circle on the table, put a needle in the center, and read an incantation. I don't remember who they summoned first. Anyway, they asked questions to the spirit, first to one, then to another, then to a third. And he'd answer. I saw with my own eyes how the needle really moved. It wasn't the movements of the summoner that would spin the needle, it wasn't the wind or anything else. I checked out all the variations, watching it from the third bunk, the needle was moving, pointing towards the letters inside the circle. The letters, which, turned into words, and the words into sentences. These morons started asking for all sorts of prison shit, when do we get the transfer, when is my family coming to visit, who in the cell is a pussy and who is not, alluding to me, and other shit. The spirit answered them all sorts of nonsense, like the show's tomorrow. The spirit even told about me, that it, the spirit, was the soul of a dead girl whom I strangled in Gomel on Jarjinsky Street. I read about spiritualism and found out later that these spirits summoned in such a way are almost always bullshit, but that's not the point. Eventually Villa wanted to summon the spirit of his dead mother, who had died less than a year before. He summoned her, asked her if she was offended that he hadn't been to her funeral, etc etc anyway, the whole thing went on for 5 hours. For 5 hours they stood there, almost motionless, staring at this circle. After they sat down for a while, both of them had a headache and felt weak. They were out for the rest of the evening. Some time passes. Maybe a day or so. I'm sitting on my bunk, reading a book. Salaya offered me tea, because he was standing near the water heater, to the attentive brains at once, do not catch me at a contradiction, we fought very often, but it did not prevent us from serving each other tea, this is the order of things, because as I said, if all three were to come down from the bunk, started moving, brew tea, etc then the cell in its size would not suffice. I took the tea, sat and drank it. I reached the bottom, there was just a spot left at the bottom, and then something pulled me to look inside the mug. There, at the very bottom was a washcloth, a razor blade from a disposable razor. To say that I was dumbfounded is nothing. Imagine what would have happened if I had swallowed it. So, of course, I went straight to Salaya. I show him the mug, what is it? I ask him. His fucking face goes red. He says he doesn't know how the fuck it got in there. The first thing I did, of course, was start to think he planted it, but that's really fucked up, you can get your fucking spine broken for that. And really dumb of him and he's a sly son of a bitch, to do this to my throat. Though, that's not the point. We have long wondered how the razor blade could have gotten into the mug, maybe it fell from somewhere, etc., but we did not come to any plausible conclusion. As a result, the next time we argued, Salaya started accusing me of planting it myself to accuse him. Time passed. Razors began to appear several times everywhere, in the bed, the toilet, on the table. They just appeared where no one had put them, all convicts dismantle plastic machines into sinks for household needs, but never scatter them around the house, firstly because the guards, when they see them, will take them away, and secondly it is a dangerous object. And every such appearance was accompanied by arguing and the accusation that I was the one who had planted it. Then my fellow inmates went even further, saying that it was my meditations that caused the razors to appear in the cell. I communicated with them less and less. A curious detail. Firstly, in the cell you can't do almost anything secretly, you sit down to disassemble the machine, it is visible, you put something in the sink, everyone sees it, so that neither I nor they could plant the razors unnoticed. Secondly, each machine has a certain pattern of razors, i.e., the holes that hold it in place on the machine. Each model of machine has its own pattern. The ones we had in the prison were only certain models, with a completely different pattern, and then there were razors with a pattern that we do not have in the prison and did not exist for that matter. We have thought of all the options, racked our brains, any extraneous hit was ruled out for the reasons I outline above.
And then the following happened. Saliah was taken to the pen for 10 days. Villa and I were left alone. He immediately started licking my ass and making friends with me, but that's another story. So one day I got off the bunk and onto the bench to do some yoga. He was sitting on the bench. He didn't get up during my exercise. I worked out, went on the bunk. And then I see it. At the head of my bed, a few centimeters from my pillow, there are two razor blades crosswise. Like an X. That's when I freaked out. I say to Villa, look over here. He goes over there, takes a look and is freaked out as much as I was. I questioned him for a long time to see if he was fucking with me, if he had planted the razors, but he swore that he never even got up from the bench. The third bunk was really high up, to get in there and put something, especially inconspicuously was next to impossible. I felt I was really in trouble at the time, as there was nowhere to go out of the cell. The whole time I was talking to Khaldun about what to do and how to stop this shit. He told me it was a ghost, and advised me all kinds of bullshit, leave milk there at night, candy, read spells, etc., we did all that and it didn't do shit. In the end, Saliah came back from the kitchen, and we went back to the way we were before, with hatred and contempt for each other. The fuckers kept accusing me of causing this because of my meditation. By the way, I woke up one night when they were talking to each other and Villa was telling Saliah the story about the razors on my bed, and I could hear the fear in his voice, which again proves that it wasn't a laughing contest, otherwise they would have both been laughing at me and not whispering about what had happened in a frightened tone. In the end, Koldun said that we probably didn't close the door to that world when we summoned the spirits, so the spirits kept leaking in and doing all kinds of shit to us in the cell. He promised to close the portal. That same day, he read a spell in the next cell, did something, which I didn't see, of course, and, let me tell you Anons, everything in the cell stopped. Except for the asshole cellmates. That's the whole story. Then I was moved to another one of Troniki's cell, and for three months I was in with the relatively normal people without any problems. And then they took me away from the holding cells to the Kritka, prison, itself. My opinion, Anons, is that this devil, Salaya, is an energy vampire with black thoughts and black energy. They opened the portal for the spirits but didn't close it, so all the low-level shit they summoned stayed in the house, making poltergeist and feeding on the negative energy of our quarrels and evil thoughts. What's more, it also encouraged, at least for Salaya, to continue fighting, rudeness, and rambling in order to eat. Just like Costaneda's flyers. They completely occupied his mind and consciousness, guiding his behavior. I tried many times to make peace with him and establish a normal relationship, but all to no avail. After each reconciliation he suddenly turned on and the swearing began again. Which was exactly what the pilots needed. Salai, by the way, was in jail for murder. His sentence was 15 years. This one was told to me by detainees from IK-10, Novopolitsk, Vyutsyepsk region. In fact, this penal colony no longer exists, it was disbanded and turned into an LCTU, rehabilitation labor camp. So a vagabond came there one day and said he was the Vatican. I don't know the details, but he had some serious cockamamie issues. They wanted to accuse him of something, but they didn't even have time to put him into a press hata. Like a true vagabond, he went immediately from the quarantine to the Kitcha, prison. Or to the penitentiary, I don't remember exactly. Either way, under the roof, prison. And there, without thinking twice, he in order to leave this world as a vagrant. Just like that. It's interesting that all the 10 guys I saw on the roof told me one after another that something strange started going on in the kitchen after that. Daps kept turning on spontaneously, both in the toilets and on the wash basin. Objects were falling. Strange knocks were heard. No one wanted to sit in the cell where the Vatican hanged himself. A local priest would come and wave his censer. Nothing helped. 